level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. I'm going to make friends. I'm just trying to save you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and put crazy days like today into context. So call me, 1-800-743-CBC, or put me in Jim Kramer. This morning, we witnessed the second largest bank failure in American history, which naturally created a wave of fear as the day went on. Hence, the Dow only losing 345 points, SME falling 1.45%, the NASDAQ coming 1.76%. The fear actually makes sense. I listen to some of the smartest people all day, and I concluded that nobody, not even the Fed, knows what happens when the most important bank in Silicon Valley gets seized by the FDIC, as was what happened today. Yeah, we left here with no real idea. Will there be contagion? Could this be an outlier? We just don't know. At first, boss, there was some strength in the market, but the weakness contained with the banks and tax, as in which banks that has to fall and which tech stocks going to get hurt because it has money there, which startups will be crushed. I mean, hey, look, we just found out this evening that Roku had 26% of its considerable $1.9 billion cash worth with this company. And we know there's never just one cockroach in a bank's kitchen. Who knows? Maybe there are companies that trade now or are going to come public that are just plain done. Stick a fork in them. So by the end of the day, we got a nasty sell-off in anything that needs a strong economy. Banks, tax, signals, boots. Who knows where all that money is? And maybe a recession could be caused by this bank. Yeah, they're failure. What other companies kept their money in the bank? It's all I know. But why do we do this? Why do we do something that's not rash, but rational? Let's step back for one moment. There's one key way in which this bank failure could actually be good news for all of your stocks. Now, I didn't hear many people offer this view today. Sure, any institution remotely connected to SVP, depositors, borrowers, venture capitalists, is going to be hurt and hurt big time. There's going to be some major losses. But you know what? Even with those losses, I do not see this as a systemic problem. I actually see it as a cool hand loop problem. As in, what we got here is a failure to communicate. SVB downplayed it was getting killed on its bond portfolio each time the Fed raised interest rates. The bank didn't signal that it had too many bad uh, loans. Uh, they were backed up in, in stock, uh, in startups that haven't been able to come public because there's no appetite for IPOs when the Fed's tightened aggressively. It should have been raising money like crazy for months like some of the other banks out there. Instead, it seemed frozen during the headlights, seemingly just pretending that things were okay. Which brings me to the key question. Can the Fed really keep tightening like crazy before they know how bad the contagion might be from SVP's demise? I don't think that'd be prudent. Can the Fed really raise interest rates dramatically when it doesn't know what could happen they, or now that they've blown a hole in the most vibrant and viable part of the U.S. economy? Tech? I don't think so. Of course, there's nothing wrong with the market's negative reaction the last couple of days. Bank failures are bad, especially when we have no idea how extensive the collateral damage will be. Don't want to sugarcoat that. But the Fed's been fighting against inflation, and there's nothing more deflationary than the collapse of a highly indebted bank. Nothing. It would be reckless for them to keep tightening aggressively now that banks are going under. Jay Powell wants to hit the brakes on the economy, but he doesn't want to cause an 18-car pile <laughs> And look, even though the market was right to sell off, it was wrong for everything to get hit. The defensive recession boost stock should have been bought in today's weakness, not sold if you really think recession's upon us. The cyclical smokestack stocks might not need it to have been sacrificed in the order of price stability. What's bad today actually may be good once everything is sorted out. Well, it won't be sorted out this weekend. I do want you to stay the course. We bought very small for the Travel Trust today. We're probably going to be buying big on Monday. When we come in, though, I think we'll learn that the fallout from SVB can derail a huge chunk of the growth economy. Those guys were in business with so many venture capitalists and big tech firms, but it will also stay the Fed's hand, which helps so many other stocks. At the very least, I doubt we'll get more than uh, one more 25 basis point rate hike. Well, if we knew that we're going into today, we'd be so happy. Because the Fed doesn't want banks failing due to their own failure to communicate. 
I think SUVs pretty similar to what happened in Penn Square roughly 40 years ago. This was a reckless bank that made a ton of loans against then the red hot commodity of oil. And then oil collapsed and took Penn Square with it. That bank failure had huge repercussions for the entire financial system as it took down another story bank, Continental Illinois. That was a monumental failure. This time, I don't think the Fed wants to allow something like that to happen. And the easiest way to prevent it is by slowing the pace of the rate hikes. I think Pal, a banker of my vintage, remembers Penn Square as oil then was like tech now. He doesn't want to repeat that error. It was terrible. And let's not forget, this morning we got a weaker non-farm payroll report, especially of the wage line. That number alone might have kept the Fed from giving us a double rate hike at this month's meeting. So to make it clear, the collapse of SVB has huge ramifications beyond the tech world. But I actually think the biggest impact is that it'll be, able to, it'll be the thing that keeps the Fed from wrecking the entire economy. Because the most overheated part of this economy has already been frozen. It's short-term bad, but longer term, I will tell you, very, very good. Unless you live and work in the blast zone, or you bank at Silicon Valley Bank. With that in mind, let's go over our game plan for next week. Even though I've made this whole argument about how the SVB failure will make the Fed back off, and, you know, maybe something that, that we're not uh, thinking enough about, the CPI could hurt us. But if we get a weak number, a weak reading, if the CPI's numbers at all cool. You'll hear people wondering if the Fed will even raise rates at all when the Open Market Committee meets on March 21st. So that's the most important macro number of the week. I also want to listen to Lenore, the conference, and their conference call. Now, by the way, these are some of the most thoughtful people in all of the industry, of, of all industry, not just homebuilders. And they'll let us know if there's any break whatsoever in housing prices. See, the Fed's been really frustrated by the seeming inability of home prices to come down. And it got more bad news today when bond yields went down in reaction to the SUV collapse. Of course, that means mortgage rates are going to fall. So Lenar might be actually bullish for the housing business, but not so good for the Fed. Score one for the macro bears, even as the micro bulls will keep making money in the stock. Wednesday's important action comes from Adobe. This is a company that's trying to make a deal that could keep its creative cloud offering competitive with an outfit called Canva. The regulators have been fighting the merger, though. At the same time, Adobe could soon be challenged by artificial intelligence, notably a chat GPT we all talk about, which has the potential to be real bad for copywriters who are core users of Adobe's product. I'm more, less sanguine about the stock than it used to be. But we also hear from a company I still like very much, and that's called Five Below. The, and this is fun, inexpensive retail, and kids love it, in part because of the low price points. By the way, it tends to trade with Ulta, which had a terrific quarter yesterday. That's another super growth retailer, more on them later. Hey, speaking of super growth, Dollar General reports on Thursday. And now, this is a favorite of Wall Street, which seems to be transfixed on the trade down. That means that you're definitely trading down if you go to Dollar General. A strong number shows a cash-strapped consumer, which means another arrow in the 25 basis point rate hike quiver. And the close we hear from FedEx. Now, until today, the stock seemed was just unstoppable, but now it got stopped in its tracks. And some investors pulled out of the cyclicals, betting that Jay Powell would keep tightening no matter what. I find that unbelievable now that Silicon Valley Bank's going under. It can't tighten and, and not tighten at the same day. Finally, on Friday, we get a slew of manufacturing data that might not reflect the post-Silicon Valley Bank world, which is a very different world from the pre-Silicon Valley Bank world. So if these numbers are hot, they may not matter after what happened today. On the other hand, maybe Jay Powell will say, man, this economy is still red hot, despite the SVB going under situation. Bottom line, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, it's just one more double-edged sword in a market that's just full of them. Russell in New York, Russell. Hey, Jim, how are you? Many thanks for I'm everything. okay, Russell. How are you? Good. A quick one. Uh, Expedia, I'd like to know if this is a good time to get into that stock, or should I hold up or I have to tell you, I genuinely believe that if you want travel right now, I like Airbnb as a way to be able to go around the world very inexpensively. Let's go to Mark in California. Mark. Hey, Jim. I have a technical question about a stock that both of you, both of us love. Um, it's Portillo's. They came out with an offering of 8 million shares of their Class A common stock. And they offered it at a price of $21.05, which is great. However, um, my question is, they said that it's not going to be dilutive to current shareholders. 
How is that possible? Well, that stock already existed. It just wasn't free to trade. But what does bother me, I got to tell you, is the timing of that. Why didn't they hell off? The market just got real bad. It would have been a much better time to wait to be able to get rid of that, to be able to offload that stock in what was called a synthetic secondary transaction. Very hard for everyone to understand. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is just one more double-edged sword in a market that's full of them. Well, man, money tonight, Clean Harbors is in the business of cleaning up a host of emergency spills. So does the company have what it takes to clean up your portfolio in the face of volatility? Don't miss my exclusive with the CEO. Then I just mentioned Ulta reported what I consider next excellent quarter, but Wall Street didn't agree with me until the end of the day. I'm thinking of the stock's crazy action in the market. And with fear surrounding the banks and commercial real estate, how could that impact a company like Reality Income? Letter O. I'm learning more about the story with the company's top brands. So stay with Kramer.